Darkcast Network, the light shines brightest on our indie podcasts. On November 3rd, 1981, Marcy Conrad, a 14-year-old ninth grader at Russell Junior High School in Milpitas, California, decided to ditch her afternoon classes and go hang out with her friend, Anthony Jock Broussard, a 16-year-old who went to Milpitas High School. From this decision, Marcy will lose her life and not be found for two more days. This story, because of what happens in between Marcy's death and until she is found, became a national discussion that inspired a Hollywood movie and took extreme paths which seemed to lose sight that a 14-year-old girl who had a future ahead of her lost it all. On this episode of California True Crime, we discuss the murder of Marcy Conrad. Hello and welcome to this episode of California True Crime. Thank you for joining us. I would also like to thank my co-hosts for joining me, Jessica and Charles. How are you doing? Doing good. I'm also doing well. So let's start like always. Did you guys know this case before we started researching it? I did know a little bit about this case prior to, but I'm excited to learn a lot more. I, I didn't really... I think maybe just knowing that the, that something like this occurred, but didn't know any of the specifics or or even really that it was a California case. I was a little more familiar with the movie that was based on the event. Right, that's the same way with me. I didn't. I watched the movie years ago. Watched it many a times. Had no clue that it was part of this. As usual, I had never seen or heard of the movie. Oh, okay. Uh, this whole story is very out of control, and to me, I mean. The, the response to everything that went on, I feel that people, at least from what I read in the newspapers and other articles, that, they, that right away they lost all thought of what actually happened, that a 14-year-old girl was murdered. Things we will discuss just go to a weird narratives and almost feel like pointing fingers at someone else and or why kids are horrible. I might be getting off track, but everything that I was reading was bothering me. I think as we start here, I'm, I'm going to try and give you everything I found about Marcy because she is the victim here and we need to know her memory. Marcy Conrad was born on February 5th, 1967 in Bloomer, Wisconsin. She moved to California when she was three with her parents. Marcy was a ninth grader at Russell Junior High School, which I thought was interesting that junior high had a ninth grade. Yeah, it's, it's not as popular around here uh, as it used to be, but... There is kind of a difference between middle school and junior high in certain places. Sometimes you'll you'll find like middle schools will be six, seven, and eight, and sometimes junior highs could be seven, eight, and nine. Uh, most of the time now, I think if if you're listening to this, you're more familiar with like the seven, eight junior high. But um, I think I think earlier on, late sixties, early seventies, it was a lot more common to have a a junior high school and then a senior high school. The principal of the school said she was a solid student with, quote, honor roll capabilities. Uh, This is all I really found besides two pictures of her. It's just really shocks me that this was in so many papers constantly around the whole country. And this was the bulk of what we had on the victim. I know it was 1981. And from what I read, this is just a strange time on how people feel about each other. But any thoughts on this? So this is a really heavily covered crime. Yeah, like many papers, there was discussions all across the country about it, but everything was not about the victim. It's what we'll get into later. No, nothing really seemed about her. It it was it was sad to me. Do you know if the family, like in those newspaper articles that you that you found, was the family talked to, and, or did they have a spokesman? I know we've seen a lot of cases where the family like has a spokesperson that will speak to the press more so later um, than some of our earlier cases. But I did not see anything from the parents that much or a spokesperson. They just didn't, maybe they wanted to be private and that's totally fine. I just feel like how the news can dig and dig. They just, 
didn't find much at all. As we go along with this case, I'll try to give you as much info as I can, but some things like story, stories change as things go along. Like I said, this case or the discussions that followed were everywhere. So I use many papers locally and nationally, uh, and you can find all the work cited that we always use at our website, californiatruecrime.com. Before we actually get into what happened, um, I think I'm, Charles is, has some background on Milpitas, and then uh, Jessica's going to talk about Marsh Road, which is in Milpitas. Yeah, Milpitas is kind of an interesting spot. Uh, it's a, a city in the Santa Clara County in California, um, situated in what most people would know of as Silicon Valley. Uh, the population now in 2020 is around 80,000 people, so not what you'd think of as, as a large city. Um, but a, a pretty good size, uh, uh, especially for that area. So Melpitas uh, was originally part of a Spanish land grant. Uh, before that, it was inhabited by uh, a group of people called the Taman people um, who are indigenous to California. What I found interesting about this and why I bring it up is because uh, as we talk a little bit about Melpitas' history, Melpitas is kind of had this reputation of being in between places. And so even the original settlers, uh, some of our archaeologists have found evidence that they traded up and down Northern California from Sacramento all the way down to, to Monterey Bay, which I thought was kind of interesting. Um, you flash forward uh, up into the 1850s, you're going to get an, uh, the first big influx of people. You have German and Irish immigrants coming into California and setting up shop as well as English immigrants. Um, and and things kind of, of progress from there. In 1920, I thought this was interesting. Uh, one of America's very first fast food chains was started in Melpitas. It was called The Fat Boy, which is amazing. Uh, I'm going now eagerly trying to look up information on Fat Boy Restaurant. For most of Melpitas history, it is a farming community up until the 1950s. And, and this is where Melpitas' uh, history kind of takes a turn in, in kind of an interesting way. In the 1950s, um, Milpitas is is almost seen as a suburb of San Jose, and San Jose starts to make overtures to annex Milpitas. Around that same time, the Ford Manufacturing Company decides to set up shop in Milpitas and build uh, a, an enormous manufacturing outfit that will eventually bring more work and jobs. Um, they're also transferring a bunch of, of employees there. Um, and because of this, Milpitas actually starts to fight and to incorporate and really the this fight carries over because it's a constant battle between san jose and melpitas for a few years eventually they incorporate and, and um, melpitas becomes its own city also uh with the influx of ford you're gonna get more like i said uh, more work and with that comes a lot more industry and what we know of melpitas now is that melpitas is really um uh kind of uh, an affordable place in the Silicon Valley. So there's a lot of tech jobs. Um, the median income is is close to eighty to ninety thousand uh, dollars. And in in past up until recently, it was um, again relatively affordable for for Silicon Valley. Uh, and just uh, one notable person from Elpidus, which, which I was kind of excited to see from uh, Andy Weir, who's a science fiction writer. He wrote The Martian. It's weird because when you were talking to me about Milpitas, I always think of that. I don't know if I'm always just keeping in mind San Jose or something, but I think of it as a big city. Mm -hmm. And I mean, that's a small population. That's smaller than Modesto. Yeah. And actually, if you go back far, you look at their demographic data in 1960, and which is not that long ago when you really think about it. 1960, their population is 6,500, roughly. They get their first big boom in 1950. It's really about 1955, 1956 when the Ford manufacturing comes in. By 1970, they've grown to 26,500 people. That's a 300% increase from where they were. Um, and then every census after that, their population, I, I won't say doubles, but gets pretty darn close to doubling. And they get another another big boom in um, 2010 to 2020, and I think that's where we really see a lot of the big the big tech companies coming in. But when this crime happens in 1980, it's still a pretty small town. Yeah, in 1980, it's around 37, 38 thousand people. So so we're we're talking about a small town feel. 
But when you really look at Melpitas, Melpitas is a, is a small town that enjoys being a small town and have, has fought for that. In fact, their their town seal is the uh, is the Minuteman with the the mountains behind them, the California mountains behind them, showing that we're standing up to be independent against San Jose. So they've really fought for this independence and then this being their own entity. Their schools are some of the best in the state. In fact, they have a they have the best continuation school for at risk students in California. The movie really portrays this area as like super depressive and like really you know it's it's just trash. Melpitas isn't. So on the afternoon of November third, nineteen eighty one, Marcy Conrad left school early to go hang out with her friend Anthony Jock Broussard. He was a 16-year-old boy who went to a different school of Milpitas High. Broussard was also no small kid. At 16 years old, he was 6 foot 4 and weighed 280 pounds. Marcy and Broussard had been friends since they were young. They went to Broussard's house, and this is where Broussard raped and strangled Marcy. We will get into more of the detail and the story about that later on. He put Marcy's body which was only wearing a brown tank top and socks, into his truck. He drove her out to a hill by the ravine on Marsh Road, where he left her body. Marcy's mother reported her missing to the police when she didn't show up home after school. Now, Jessica has some information on Marsh Road, where uh, Marcy's body was left. So there isn't too much historical information on this road. Most of it has to do with this crime. But Marsh Road is a part of the Diablo Range. It's just east of Milpitas in the Calaveras Valley. And it's south of the Calaveras Reservoir. So it's very hilly terrain. It's foothilly terrain. If you guys have seen the Zodiac movie where they're at Lake Berryessa, that's about two hours from here. But it's very similar terrain, that scene. That's what you would see here. There's not much out here. Uh, There's a couple of ranches, uh, some farms. It's just a lot of empty land. Maybe there are animals on it. And there are a lot of different ravines. So this would have been a place you could go easily to. It's about 19 miles from Milpitas High School. You probably wouldn't see anybody else out there. So this is not this is not like a public park or a or even a an out of the way campground that people would this this is more of a, a place that maybe locals would know to go and hang out, especially teenagers looking to like mess around or. Yeah. So this is really deep into the foothills or getting deeper into the foothills. Marsh road is pretty long. It's very windy. It ends in an area called poverty Ridge deep in the Valley. Mm -hmm. And most of that road is actually based on what I can see from Google maps dirt. So most of the road isn't even open to the public. There's a handful of ranches out there and just a lot of land. This is very similar to what we had in high school. I don't know if, Jessica, you ever went, but there was a road, a dirt road. The cowboys would have keggers in the back of their truck. There's no lights. They had, like, flood lamps, and you would hang out on the dirt road, and (laughs) there was keggers out there. Do you remember that at all? Yeah, I do. And I I really think it's a very, yeah, similar thing. I don't think a lot of people would be driving by. What's interesting, though, to me is, especially at the 1980s at the time, you have to go through a lot of land that's already like that to get to Marsh Road. There's a ton of empty space, even more so at the time, um, that you would consider, you know, with lots of ravines and valleys, and there's not much there um, before you even get to Marsh Road. So it's just kind of interesting location. And I'll have a picture of that, kind of a map, so people can see. And I think it makes sense as you tell the story, Sean, that it is a place where people could go and nobody's really going to bother them. Or, you know, if you see a bunch of kids on the side of the road or whatever, it's you know, no big deal. You're not thinking too much about it. There's probably uh, hiking trails and a bunch of different creeks and uh, watering holes and things like that to fish in. So yeah, that, it's it's the same thing. Like I, when I was a kid too, I, I had the railroad tracks, and you know, you'd hang out on the r- railroad tracks and follow them and go places and stuff like that. Well, and with this with this road, the way you described it, it's not like people are going to be driving by it anyway. You know, it's not. It again, it's not a a public place it's not a, a campground it's not where an average person would be driving by if you know the only people on that road or have a reason to be there yeah if you own the land around there right. or if you're going to someone's house yeah the next day Broussard was hanging out with his friends in the Golfland arcade parking lot 
He told them that he had killed Marcy and they didn't believe him, so he took his friends there. One article said he was just trying to tell his, quote, best friend. He supposedly said, quote, you want to trip on something heavy? I killed Marcy yesterday. The others overheard this, and no matter what, he, he took multiple people up to see Marcy's body. Even then, the friends looking at the body of Marcy still might have been in shock and didn't believe him. They poked at the body to make sure it wasn't a mannequin. The papers, I think because of a way to make the story more shocking, uh, the papers just talked about how one kid either threw or dropped a rock on her face to see if she was real. They never brought up the size of the rock. Um, I just think it was in like every article, and I think the paper was just really trying to put that in there. None of these kids told the police, but instead, it seemed a game of telephone started, and the story got out. Rumors started going around the school. Some of the kids made $5 bets on whether or not Broussard actually killed her. I also read that a girl ripped off a radio station patch from Marcy's jeans that were on the side of the road. So then he took, he took the rest of her clothes up there as well? Yeah, he must have just thrown them out of the truck because it was just on the side of the road. Sean, so this is the, the kids go out there on the second day, and we know Marcy's mom has reported her missing to police. But before they go out there, has someone told, you know, the school or the, her friends at school or these kids that Marcy is already missing? You know, I'm not sure. Uh, that never, I never saw anything about that. And like, like we talked about at the beginning, the mom didn't talk much. So I don't know if the mom contacted friends before she called the police. Uh, I don't know if the friends really thought it was odd if the mom contacted them. I don't know how much the police took this seriously. Um, I didn't, you know, find too much about that. And uh, so I'm not I'm not really sure. Which would make sense why some of them may not have believed Bassard at the beginning, you know, before they went out there. If there was no contact, if they weren't aware that she was missing and he comes with some story of. Oh, I killed her. Right. One of the people that went up and saw Marcy's body had actually dated her, and that person brought along his eight-year-old brother to see Marcy. People would come up and down to look at Marcy's body over two days. Some went up multiple times. So, so he just keeps talking, and more people go up. He either takes them or people go on their own. A counselor at the school said 98% of kids were good kids and prince and the principal said on record that the ones that viewed the body were quote problem students in the next paragraph from this article it talks about how some kids weren't even uh really Broussard's friends and went to view the body but quote shared no more with him than the habit of spending lunch recess in the campus smoking area so i looked it up and in 1981, you only had to be 16 to legally smoke tobacco. And in 87 is when it changed to 18. So I just thought that was crazy that the high school actually had a smoking area. Yeah, it's so unfamiliar. Right. I, I do can't, I can remember going to like our, our local high school and, and when I was real young and going into the teacher's lounge and, and seeing like ashtrays in the teacher's lounge. One of the kids also asked why Broussard did it, and Broussard just laughed. He told a lot of people about what he did while laughing. So it seems like, Sean, you're saying there's a lot of details about people viewing the body, but not a lot of details about the actual person who's there, who's right. been murdered. Yeah, all these articles. Once you get past the initial newspaper article saying that Marcy was found— and that she was murdered by Broussard, then it just goes into this. It, it, it steers away from the murder. Are the, those same sources that, aren't, that don't necessarily cover Marcy Conrad, do they cover Broussard in any detail, or is it the same where he killed her, but there's no real information about his backstory? Or? For the first couple months before the tr like getting into trial, there's really nothing. It just goes off on this thing that we'll talk about soon. So finally, there's a group that went up on November 5th, two days after this all happened, and they actually went to the police. 
how the story goes that I read, it was that one kid had gone up and then told two other kids. The other kids were 16 and one was 18 and was already out of school. They didn't believe the friend who went up there already. So one friend, one guy goes up, he meets up with two other friends who haven't gone up, tells them they don't believe him. So they all three go back up. When they saw the body, they immediately decided they needed to go to the cops, these two new kids. The two went back to the police, told them, and they got, they got questioned right away, even got handcuffed to a desk at the police station. So once these boys went and told the police, uh, Broussard was arrested that same day while at his father's house. He entered a, plea, entered a plea of not guilty of rape and murder, and bail was set at $150,000. Overall, 13 kids went up to see the body. One thing that was weird was the first article that I could find wasn't until November 23rd. So this happens on the 3rd. November 5th is when the body's discovered, but nothing really comes out. I don't know if this was because maybe they were youth and they had to like get it all set up, but this is like weeks later that the first article comes out. I wonder how much of that too might be from the fact that the more salacious parts of this case don't really come out until they're really starting to interview Bassard and and doing their due diligence and looking around at schools and, and start to realize that a lot more people knew about this than originally yeah. were let on. It is interesting, though, because this would really begin with a parent and their child not coming home. And there's not an article on, you know, this 14-year-old who's missing. Who's Yeah, who's missing. Right. Well, yeah, too. And she's she's missing for two days yeah so you do have to kind of wonder a little bit how seriously that was taken right did they just blow it off as like a runaway situation or just someone off doing something and we do know from i mean again if you've listened to this show and some of our previous episodes you know we've did have pointed out that that whole thing about you being having to be gone for 24 hours before you're you're missing is a movie thing you know, most police will, you know, if you're missing out of the ordinary, you report it to the police and they do something. So with this whole thing, what was discussed most instead of the murder was this, quote, code of ethics or the power of the code. That's where there was some generation gap between parents and kids that wouldn't turn in Broussard. They also say uh, since both parents work now so it's like the whole latchkey kid thing there was all these like blaming they uh there was a talk of about drugs being a factor i guess talking about it in hindsight would you turn him in if you were one of the kids that went and saw the body so le- i just want to recap here marcy's murdered two days go by kids go up and down multiple times 13 kids total but multiple times up and down none of them turn in uh, Broussard or that the body was there to the police until the second day. And so now there's this national talk about these, these kids that didn't turn it in with this code of silence. In hindsight, would you have turned in the body? For myself, I, I don't know how to answer it as a 16-year-old or, you know, 16, 17. I have no clue what I would do in that situation because I would probably be scared to death and just scared. You guys? Yeah, I know. Like for me now, yeah, of course I would turn him right. in. Didn't matter who it was. But I, I do think you bring up a, a good point of the idea of like 16 year old me, you know, the awkward 16 year old me that was version of me that worried about peer pressure that was trying to fit in and that kind of stuff. I would like to think that even at 16, I would have, I would have turned him in, but it, it, I think it's hard for us to answer as adults. Yeah. It's hard to think back and knowing what we know now about the psychology of these kinds of events. I mean, I'd like to say I would do something different. I don't know that I would. I a hundred percent have faith that I have a friend who would have at the time. So I probably would never have had to have dealt with it but so you but saying that jessica yeah you would have faith that someone else would do it for you yeah it's like so, a bystander effect right, right? Yeah. well and, yeah and you bring that you bring that up and we've talked about it before just recently too that idea of of if one person says other people are more likely to to say something yeah and it is 
you know, like you said, Sean, the victim gets lost in the story, right. you know, and unfortunately the, the sensational part of this is the fact that so many kids went up over two days, you know, to, to see this poor girl lying there and none of them said anything. I can really understand why there's so much surprise and focus on this. I mean, I can see why people are, it's hard for us just to talk about it and think about this this poor young woman who's been murdered and then people are just, I mean, you know, kids are coming to see her body and it's it's hard to wrap your mind around. No, I, I totally can, get it, yeah. But I do think this is the kind of situation where adults are in these situations and don't do anything. Mm -hmm. And we obviously don't teach our kids, what do you do if this specific thing happens? And it's just, it's such an out of... Right, and I, I, I like what you said too about adults being in those situations and not react or reacting the exact same way. I mean, how many times do you hear stories about people see witnessing, you know, somebody being abused or, or I mean, you know, crimes. Well, Jessica, I, I totally understand that this is a, a big discussion because it's about adults and kids and everything. I just think, and we're going to talk about a lot of it. It's just to me while, while reading all these things, I feel like the catalyst that made this discussion happen was completely lost because none of it's actually about Marcy the whole time. So that was just, it was just hard for me to see that she's like taken out of the whole equation when it happened to her. Oh, definitely. And that crime is just as shocking in a way. Right. I mean, she's 14 and he's 16 and he leaves her half nude on the side of the road in the middle of nowhere. I mean, it's just, it's such a disgusting crime and well I, th I think on that same note that all these years later what is it that people are talking about instead of the victim is they're talking about what happens after she's killed right you know she's still lost in the story interesting quote from one of the students when asked about it not being reported uh, she said quote today's kids their real family is their friends their parents don't understand what they are going through they think they are a bunch of hoodlums, end quote. So I thought that was an interesting dynamic of, you know, she might be only knowing her own story, but like going back to what I was saying earlier about uh, both parents working and they're like latchkey kids, so they take care of themselves. Yeah, but don't you think there's a, there's a flavor of that for every generation? Like, you know, isn't that the same kind of mantra that pre previous generations have said about their parents and, you know, we said about our parents our our kids say about say about us it's it's one generation struggling to try to figure out the the previous one's mentality and and vice versa right because it's not all kids the this really back and forth went on between parents and kids and a writer of the San Francisco Examiner went off saying it wasn't the parents or school's fault but blames television and calls it the babysitter and arcade games like Defender, Asteroids, and Centipede. Quote, Worse than television, actually, are coin video games, which don't even offer television facade of plot and values, however corrupt. They concern themselves solely with destruction. Slip in your coin and kill the invader, vaporize the asteroids, blast the tank, unquote. So when I read this, that I, to me, it felt like, Maybe it's hindsight for me also, but some like completely 8-bit dots, you know, on the old arcade games is not causing kids to murder. And to be a, a writer for an, a well-known newspaper to try to bring this narrative into this story really was weird to me. Yeah, but I, and I, I will say, I don't think, it, again, going back to that, what we just said, I don't think it's that much different. Like we, we had it in the eighties. We had it in the nineties, you know, in the two thousands, we had it before with rock and roll music and the evils of Elvis Presley and the Beatles and, you know, and then comic books in the fifties and, and burning, you know, that kind of stuff back into the Hayes code with the movies. I think every generation is struggling to figure out that next generation. And, and as things change, they're fearing that change and they're not understanding or, or being able to communicate. 
And then, like you said, Sean, they're blaming they're blaming this terrible act on something other than the person who actually did it. Because I think a lot of times, if you like what all the things you just named off, it's usually adults blaming those things. So it's almost like the adults don't want to take responsibility, responsibility for something that they probably didn't have any control of. So they blame everything else to make them look better. And, or in this case, there's, you know, like, like we've said, it's an, it's an unconscionable act that people are struggling to try to figure out why it happened, how it could have happened, and the response that they don't understand of these kids. It's got to be some reason. Well, let's look for an external thing that we don't understand. Oh, okay, it's video games, or it's rock and roll music, or it's, you know, in the 80s, it's slasher movies. That's what did it, you know. I feel like this really fits into a lot of what happens in the 80s where there's this kind of anger over things that happened in the 60s and 70s Mm -hmm. and uh, feminism and women leaving the home. And now we're worried about, you know, instead of being worried about kids and how we can better support families, we're worried about that effect that it's having on kids. And so we're using video games and TV and latchkey kids as a way to, to be angry about that. And the whole eighties is kind of, even politically, this kind of return to conservatism or a belief system. At least one child psychologist, Saul Wasserman was saying that children might have had an actual hard time accepting the reality. They had never actually experienced anything like this before. Quote, before people jump to conclusions about teenagers in society, they have to stop and listen to what the kids are saying about the experience of what went on. I think if the kids say they didn't believe it, we probably ought to listen to them. End quote. Going off of what uh, kids also said, uh, quote, I figure the body would have been found sooner or later. Or another kid said, if the police didn't find the murderer, they would have suspected me. Just like what the kind of what happened to the kid who turned it in. He got handcuffed to a desk and asked a bunch of questions. So just, you know, the, the fear that the police thinking that they did it. Well, and, and I think we've kind of talked a little bit around it too. The idea of that's got to be shocking for, you know, say a 16-year-old to see a dead body. Like, what are they to do? Right. And I, th- I read another thing about how... Uh, like way back in the day, you used to live like on the farm with your whole entire family and you did everything with your family. So you were more accustomed to your family dying in front of you. But now it's, you know, a family member might die at a hospital or, or already in a home where you don't actually see them die or take care of them when they die. So the shock is real when you see something like this. Well, yeah, the, the term funeral parlor comes from the idea that most people would be laid out in state in their house before they were buried. You were buried at home. So, you know, we've, we have done a pretty good job here of distancing people from death, not excusing what they did, just trying to put a different spin on like maybe why a 16 year old might not jump up and run to the authorities or understand how to process what they're seeing. Right. I really have to think that we should listen to this child psychologist or a psychiatrist, that it, this does seem like a conversation that's happening about the kids instead of including the kids. Right. Or I mean, I realize they're, they're kids, so you're not going to have them on TV. But, you know, thinking about, I mean, I, some of the stuff I read said several of these kids experienced PTSD. Mm-hmm. They, they couldn't sleep. They had terrible dreams. Some of them couldn't continue going to school. So, I mean, we're not really talking about what they actually went through. Right, right. I think the idea that most of them didn't, you know, didn't believe it when they heard the rumor. I, cause I can, I can, I could put myself in that position and say, if, you know, if my, the people I hung out with at 16, if somebody said, oh, I'd kill somebody, yeah, sure you did. You know, like, like, prove it. The newspaper interviewed some kids from Galileo High School in San Francisco, which is supposedly a rough school. There's another case that we could maybe cover in the future called the Golden Dragon Massacre. And I guess one of the people involved with that went to this school and was arrested while in class. But they interviewed one girl who said something interesting about this whole thing. She said, a lot of kids come from the environment where the parents say, if you see something, don't get involved. My parents have said that to me. So, you know, they're kids. Maybe these kids took it to heart and it wasn't supposed, the parents aren't saying, if you see a murder, you know, like report it, but not saying don't get involved kind of style. So 
What do you think about that? The only thing I would say about that is that the Golden Dragon Massacre had to do with uh, with Chinese organized crime. And given that area where that happened, the neighborhood around it was those organizations had a pretty big sway in that area. So I can see growing up in that environment, you know, being a kid or a parent trying to keep your kids on the straight and narrow saying, man, if you don't say, you know, don't get involved, don't you go to school, come home, keep, you know, keep your head out of other people's businesses. I think it's a little different when we talk about, you know, Melpitas being a rural area. I'm not saying it's not impossible. I think it's hard to compare those two environments. I tried to look up the crime rate at the time in Milpitas. I couldn't find it. Milpitas has a lot of crime now. But from 1967, uh, there were 23 police officers. And in 1990, it finally grew to 70. So during the 80s, you can imagine it's somewhere between those two numbers, which is not a very big police department. So I don't even imagine that crime was maybe an issue. These kids or kids in general, depending on where you lived in Milpitas, obviously, maybe had to always deal with. Well, one thing that, you know, talking about law enforcement, Sheriff Sergeant uh, Gary Meeker says, quote, I've never seen a group of people act so callous about death in my 15 years of police work. What the hell has happened to these kids? End quote. One thing I found interesting was that I guess people just called the police station and just talked about it and complained. And I just thought that was really like that was what people did in town they just call the police and say i can't believe this it's before facebook it's before uh social media or people had an outlet to complain so where else would you complain other than probably city hall and the police department i just think it's weird to call i wouldn't call the police department to complain or just no, to like I, give my my opinion i just think that's odd i i agree with you but i i can see people being frustrated and needing needing an outlet you know of your emergency your world can change in the blink of an eye he walked into the bedroom and you know that she had been murdered so he's running up and down screaming oh my god someone called 911 there are two men killing a girl I know my son, and he would not go that long without saying anything to anyone. Safety can be an illusion, and reality a nightmare. So how do you steal a person, a grown person? Unspeakable crimes can penetrate any small town, big family, pretty face, or innocent child. And in the wake of a loved one's murder or disappearance, there is nothing more cruel or desperate as silence. Why won't people talk about it? That's another thing. People don't want to talk about it around here. For the families of the missing and murdered, they gambled with their sanity as they lose hope in closure and settle for justice. That's where the cold case playing cards come in. In each episode of the Dealing Justice podcast, your hosts Jennifer Dubasek and Lori Jennings will spotlight one card from the cold case playing card deck. Hear the victim's story from the friends and family who knew them best. Her mom will never stop hating until she finds out what happens to her daughter. Learn about the crime and help close the case. Welcome to season two. We're not just playing cards, we're dealing justice. So it was not just Broussard that was arrested. His friend Kurt Rasmussen, who was 16, was also arrested in charge. The cops came to his school and handcuffed him and took him away, not for murder, but for being an accessory to murder for allegedly helping Broussard conceal Marcy's body. Rasmussen went to trial and was found guilty of covering the body with leaves and two paper bags. At this trial, different stories came up that Rasmussen originally said he was trying to give Broussard a head start, but in court he said he wanted to cover her body because she was only wearing the brown tank top and socks. He also said he didn't know Broussard that well and was scared of him since he was a pretty big kid. The judge, Thomas Hastings, gave him a three-year sentence at a ranch for delin delinquent boys and was also went on the record that the youth showed a, quote, perverse sense of morality, unquote. Uh, he ended up serving six and a half months at this ranch for delinquent boys. 
In February of 1982, a reporter, Glenn Bunting, he was actually one of the reporters that I used one of his articles. Uh, He was sentenced to jail for 60 days for not answering questions at the preliminary. The reporter had been spending a lot of time with the kids, and he said that they told him a, a lot of things, but he wouldn't say what they told him. He only would give them what he actually reported them saying in the papers. So he supposedly was hanging out with them at parties, and they were telling him all sorts of things. But he he kept his mouth shut at the preliminary on those things unless he had already printed it. Uh, after this, the judge would hear arguments if Bunting was allowed to do this under California Press Shield Law. The Shield Law goes all the way back to 1935, but it has had many revisions since then. But the revision that helped Bunting happened in 1974 that covered unpublished information. He had two weeks before going to jail for an appeal. This was uh, reversed later because it was improperly drafted. Did he talk about why he didn't relinquish this information or why what was what was a, what was it about this information that he didn't want out in the public sphere? I don't know if it was so much that he didn't want it out. It was just that he was the reporter who didn't have to. I, I don't know either way. Like maybe there was some information, but he didn't from the article. It didn't sound like he got like extreme information that was very important. Now, when Broussard was arrested, there was a lot that went on before we actually get into the trial. The next thing that was set was to see if he was going to be tried as an adult, which they said yes, to be tried as an adult. Broussard's preliminary hearing was supposed to start soon after this trial, but more charges were filed against him that he might have attacked two other girls. One of the girls was 13 and the other was 15. One newspaper said 12 and 14, so I'm not really sure. These allegedly were six months before the murder of Marcy. Once we got past this part, the preliminary hearings did get going, and it took five days. And afterwards, Broussard would stand trial as an adult for all four felony counts. These counts were the rape and murder of Marcy Conrad and two felony sexual assault charges against the two other girls. So the defense attorney tried to do things that we have seen in other cases he asked for a dismissal all because of bunting not talking asked for a move of venue because of a fair trial and that was not granted he also asked for a competency trial in december so which is a month after broussard killed marcy he talked to a psychiatrist for two hours but this competency trial it actually happened in june of 82 so we didn't know about no one knew about this uh, talk with a doctor for, uh, you know, over seven months. Broussard's story of the day of the murder goes like this, and this is from the December meeting in 81. Broussard said that he picked up Marcy from a store where they went to his house. They had sex and smoked cigarettes. Dr. Siegel, the psychiatrist, said, quote, For reasons which were not apparent to him, she began to argue with him and call him a chicken for not fighting with his friends when they ridiculed him or took advantage of him. He then would go on and say that Marcy joked about his mother, and that's when he grabbed her to stop her and ended up killing her. Uh, The the story about the mother, Broussard, when he was uh, seven, found his mother dead in the shower of natural causes. This was a bad subject to bring up, as Broussard would actually get angry a lot when that happened. After killing her, he said he felt, quote, initial terror um, from all this, that he was found competent to stand trial. Thoughts about this whole process, the competency, uh, you know, the whole thing about being an adult. Do you think this might have had a problem with, isn't isn't it, uh, if you're tried as a juvenile, then you're out at 25? I think this whole case seems pretty harsh. That's why they tried a 16-year-old as an adult. Any thoughts on it? I think it makes sense in this case. I know we've had issues with it, you know, and talking about it. And I'm always wondering still what I think about it. But in this kind of case where he's, you know, he's attacked two other girls, um, his reasoning. And I saw another quote he gave where one of the reasons that he murdered Marcy was that she had a big mouth. I mean, these are really signs of, for me, 
kind of very scary behavior. A pattern. Also, the not only covering up the body, but also then showing no remorse after the fact and like telling other people that it that he did it. Yeah, yeah him I, bringing people out there. Yeah, I don't have a problem. I I think this is one hundred percent that a he's competent to stand trial. You know, as a non expert, just hearing the story, but also I think I think it's correct that he stood trial as an adult. Yeah, I still it's still very hard for me. I've always had an issue with this, and I wish there was like a way where he's still a juvenile, but at twenty five, they just redo it as an adult, so he won't get out if there's no change at all. You know, but yeah, I I understand. It's it's a hard one. I think yeah. all of them are. I think all of them are. There's no doubt about that. But it's it's still a, it's always hard to see a kid. Jury selection started going on, but then there was this other th- thing that was uh, going on at the same time. It looked like there was a prisoner saying that Broussard had told him something, and the defense was trying to get it thrown out. This part seemed very fragmented in the papers, as it was as all of the papers were trying to get like the story out and there was just little information everywhere, but supposedly he confessed to a cellmate that he had killed Marcy and then had sex with her. So this was all, you know, a totally different story. So now this new story, it might've been true because after this information on July 20th, 1982, Broussard entered a plea of guilty of first degree murder With this plea, all sex charges were dropped, so he's only getting charged for the murder. Broussard was sentenced to 25 to life. In 1985, he tried to make an appeal to reduce his sentence, but that was not not upheld for lack of remorse. His first parole hearing was not until 1996. In 96, he was denied parole because of factors of the crime, uh, drug history, because he said that he was on LSD when he did it. And lack of remorse was another thing again. And he's been denied uh, parole ever since. He's still in Soledad prison. And there was an article where he was um, talking to someone later and he was saying this about his friends, like he was already in, in prison or he was still waiting trial. But he said, quote, if they had remained silent, I wouldn't be here right now. As far as I'm concerned, most of my so-called friends are dead. He also said about the death of Marcy, quote, I don't feel I have to show remorse. I'm not going to cry. Marcy's death may tear, tear me up inside, but that's the way it's going to have to be. I miss her a lot. I'm not just going to show it. So I think these two quotes from him about friends and Marcy kind of probably go with this parole hearing and everything of him not getting out because to blame his friends for, you know, turning him in when he's not taking responsibility in in the first place that he killed her. This plea deal kind of blows me away a little bit. I mean, I I just kind of wonder, I don't know what his defense would have been had he gone to trial and he doesn't seem to have much of one especially since he was proven to be sane or competent to stand trial but so he has the ability to get out of jail he just has to do the things he needs to do right and it doesn't seem like he has charles thoughts on that i'm kind of with you jessica on the idea of 25 to life with possibility of parole for not just the crime but everything else after the crime I think that has to be taken into account too. But I, and I, I, again, love the way you said he could get out, but he chooses not to do what he's supposed to, I guess, or what, what the court is asking him to do, which proves that he's probably in the right spot. Do you think the 25 to life was because he was 16 at the time? I think probably, I think probably at the time. Yeah. I can see, I can see a judge doing that maybe as a, you know he is he is under eighteen and he's tried an adult. That's maybe maybe a way that the court is saying that this is a terrible crime, but giving that person the opportunity to change and rehabilitate. It may have been way worse had he gone to trial. I I think so, but I and I I don't think I, yeah I don't think a jury of the of his peers would. And certainly, if he had been two years older. Yeah, I don't see I don't see it having a, a better. I think in I think in eighty one it we're looking at like a death penalty case. It's possible if they went to trial. So in nineteen eighty six, the movie River's Edge came out uh, by director Tim Hunter. The movie was inspired 
by the murder of Marcy and has many similarities and differences. If you have not seen the movie, it follows the story of John, who has killed his friend Jamie. Left her at the river's edge, friends come up and look. Lane, played by Crispin Glover, tries to help John get away with it, but Matt, played by Keanu Reeves, who also saw the body, it weighs on his conscience, and he ends up uh, calling the police. This follows the story pretty well. When Matt calls the police, they bring him in to the police station, and they try to say he helped. They also bring up how John would get upset if anyone talks about his mother. So there's a lot of similarities in this movie. Things that were different pretty much to make it like a Hollywood movie was some main characters in the movie. There was Tim, who was Matt's 12-year-old brother, who was just this pretty out-of-control kid. And then there was also Feck. Feck is played by Dennis Hopper, who his story is he killed a woman way back in the day, but... That was because he loved her, and now he's like a recluse who lives with Ellie, which is an inflatable sex doll. So there's, you know, just a lot to make it more weird. And like uh, Charles, like you were saying, you know, they make they make the town like and everything really grungy. By this time, since the movie was out, they really focused on metal music and stuff like that, which wasn't brought up during, you know, like in the newspapers for the actual case, but. I, I really like the movie. I watched this movie many years ago, but didn't know it was based on this. In the movie, there wasn't any reference that I saw. Uh, the people like Ebert gave it a rave review. Many didn't like the movie, like people close to the true story. They said there was uh, enough horribleness with the story that it didn't need to add some random characters. The movie also might be based loosely on the murder of Ricky Casso. That happened in New York in 1984. In that story, four kids high on PCP were in the woods and a fight broke out and Casso was stabbed almost 36 times. The body was not found for two weeks and the murderer bragged and took kids up to see the body. And you guys got a chance to recently watch the movie. Also, what, what did you think? Well, knowing the case now. Uh, yeah, because I, I do remember the movie from the 80s. I never watched it. It wasn't. There were a lot of, I've watched a lot of movies. It wasn't, it never really came up on something that I would kind of sit down and watch. I knew it was a drama. I knew it was kind of acclaimed, but never went around to it. And then, like you said, when we came, came up, we had the opportunity to, um, to, or I, I had the opportunity to stream it not too long ago. Uh, I did not care for it. Okay. Um, I did not like it as a movie. I've read some stuff, uh, you know, Ebert's uh, piece on it that he wrote in 87, uh, 86, 87. Uh, I liked his critique of it. I, I agree with a lot of it. I think it's a well-made movie. It, it's, to me, is not a movie that's, it's not something I think I'll go back to many times and watch again. I I, I enjoyed reading a few pieces um, that dealt with Tim Hunter's point of view. And I, I think, you know, he talked a lot about the idea that this movie was, you know, the initial kernel of inspiration came from this case, but it, the movie was not necessarily about the murder that that was, that that was kind of a, a story point that was driving the, the deeper story of, of these kids dealing with something that was, that n nobody knew how to deal with and their kind of fight against the next generation. And I, I got all that. I, I think the problem is that after we, you know, after you had researched and wrote about the case and we had talked about it, it was really hard to watch this movie knowing like it's it's based on – like it, whether it's it's fully based or inspired by or whatever, we're still talking about something that's similar to this actual real case. And I, I had a hard time with that. Yeah. I didn't get a chance to watch it. I've been sick. Um, I am going to watch it. I did see a couple of short scenes, so it'll be good to get a fuller picture of what the movie's about. But I think it's kind of interesting because when I did the research on Marsh Road, the main thing that comes up about that road is not this case necessarily, but ghost hunters or people who go out. Um, I saw stuff that said it's really common for kids to go out there to look for the ghost of Marcy and they use her name. And, you know, I understand we live in a town where that's what we would do, too. We'd go to like a covered bridge, supposedly that was haunted. And but it's just harder when you know the story of the person. And I saw on Facebook somebody was talking about it, and a lot of people didn't realize that you know there was a real case tied mm -hmm. to that to that ghost story. So I don't know; it just makes it difficult. Marcy's funeral was back in Wisconsin, where she was born. 
on her headstone, it says Little Dreamer. I really wish I found more about her, but this, this is it. For this episode's cold case, Charles will be telling the story. This information comes straight from the Fremont Police Department's website, which is neighboring town to Melpitas, and is dealing with the missing persons. Sherry Lynn Muehlman was last seen February 27, 1989, at about 9.30 a.m. At the time, Sherry was seen by her boyfriend, Michael Abraham, and his sister, Catherine Abraham, at Michael's house located at 3473 Dakota Road in Fremont, California. Sherry and Michael Abraham had a daughter in common who was five years old at the time of Sherry's disappearance. Sherry was last seen packing up her personal belongings inside Michael's house. Through witness statements, it was believed Michael didn't trust Sherry to take care of their daughter nor the house while he was gone at a county-sponsored work furlough program. Based on current witness statements and physical evidence located at the Dakota address, it is believed that Sherry is a victim of a homicide. The whereabouts of Sherry's body is unknown at this time. The Fremont Police Department Crimes Against Person Unit is actively investigating this case. Due to potential new evidence, investigators are reviewing physical evidence originally located in 1989 and are contacting known witnesses to the disappearance. Anyone with information about this case is asked to please contact Fremont PD Detective Jacob Blaise at 510-790-6963 or jbless at fremont, F-R-E-M-O-N-T dot gov. They will accept anonymous tips. Their silent witness hotline number is 510-494-4856. You can also send them an anonymous tip online or text TIP F-R-E-M-O-N-T-P-D, followed by your tip to 888-777. Thank you for listening to this episode of California True Crime on the DarkCast Network. For a full list of our sources as well as more information on this and all of our cases, head to our webpage at californiatruecrime.com, where you can support the show by joining our Patreon, which has options for ad-free episodes. On our website, We have up and running with some California True Crime merchandise, t-shirts, mugs, and special episode exclusive stickers. If you'd like to contact us, you can find us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Cali True Crime. Make sure that you subscribe to our show and to get our latest episodes. Leave us a five-star review and tell a friend. Get the word out about California True Crime. We'd like to thank our quality control engineer, Melanie Duncan. This was recorded at Snail Ranch Studios and The Hangar. This has been a production of The Nameless Production Company. 